Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Craig Enser. I'm the events coordinator for the Anglo Turkish Society. And we are extremely honored to have Alchin Majar to give a talk on a subject that I know nothing about. And it's a piece of history that's probably lost um, on, on both sides of the Aegean, mostly. Um, so this is a story of uh, relief um, during the Second World War by Turkey, and particularly about a ship called Kurtulush um, that uh, went back and forth into Nazi-occupied Germany, um, Nazi-occupied Greece, um, and Alcim Majar graduated from the International Relations Department of Istanbul University. He is a holder MA and PhD from the same department. He's a professor of political history in the Department of Political Science and International Relations of Yildiz Technical University, Istanbul. He is interested in religious minorities, secularism, church in Turkey and Greece, history of Turkish Greek relations. So his books are Fener Patriarchanesi, the Fener Patriarch Kate, with Yorgo Benisoy. Um, İstanbul'un yok olmuş iki cemaati, Doğu Riti, Katolik, Rumlar ve Bulgarlar. Two disappeared communities of Istanbul, Catholic Greeks and Bulgarians with Oriental rights. And many other books. So I'm not going to list them all here. So he's well versed in minority studies, shall we say, as well. Um, so perhaps we can maybe invite him in the future as well, because his um, his publication list is very impressive and many of them. Um, should have an interest to our members as well. So thank you again, Alcin Majar, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Craig, for your good words. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank to Anglo-Turkish Society and to you uh, for the invitation. Uh, today I'm going to present a ship's story that this ship uh, transported food from Turkey to Greece uh, in the occupation and famine period. Uh, of course, uh, at the background will be uh, that period, uh, Greece. Uh, and from the beginning, uh, sorry for my uh, poor English. And at the end, I will try to uh, to answer your questions, if you have. Uh, on October 28, 1940, at 3 a.m., uh, I'm sorry, I'm sharing the PowerPoint. I think it's okay. Um, Italian ambassador uh, Emanuele Grazzi, we see here, knocked on Metaxas residence door in Kifisia, Athens, woke his up and handed him the letter containing Mussolini's instructions. Referring the United Kingdom bases and troops in Greece and anti-Italian movements, Italy demanded that the Italian army be allowed free entry into the country and control some strategic points. If Greece did not accept this, Italian troops in Albania would cross the border in three hours. Without waiting for any explanation, Metaxas turned to Grazzi and addressed him in French. So, sir, this is a war. Metaxas' reply to the ambassador was translated into a single word in Greek national history, Ohi uh, means no, still is a national feast day. 
in Greece. In fact, there were two threats for Greece in the interwar period, Bulgaria and Italy. Bulgaria, since the San Stefano Treaty 1878, had the idea of Greater Bulgaria with a harbor city in Aegean shore in Western Thrace. After the Neue Treaty uh, 1919 had a revisionist policy. Metaxas, until Albania's occupation in 1939 by, Ital by the Italian forces, waited a Bulgarian attempt. Therefore, he started to construct a Metaxas line uh, in Bulgarian border, like Magino line between France and Germany in that time. Italy was one of the winners of the First World War, but she thought that she had gained nothing. After the creation of Axis by Germany, Japan, and Italy, of course, Italy became clear and imminent danger for Greece. Going back to beginning, Italian troops crossed the Greek border on the same day and began to advance inland. It's rumored that Mussolini does not tell Hitler, who does not inform him about similar situations, that he would attack Greece. He says, let Hitler learn from the newspapers. Despite modernization efforts in recent years, the equipment of the Greek army was far behind the Italians. The Navy and Air Force were very weak. But the Greek soldier, soldiers were well trained and well prepared the mountain warfare suitable for this region. The first moves in Turkey to help Greece began in a few days after the attempted Italian invasion of Greece on 28 October 1940. Turkish press openly supported the Greek army against Italy. You can see here the title of clipping. Turkey was gratified by the initial Greek victories over the Italians because Greece served as a buffer zone between Turkey and the Axis. Also, Greek citizens who live in Turkey uh, went to Athens to join the Greek army. The Red Crescent, with an agreement with the International Red Cross Committee, sent aid to the Greek Red Cross and presented three ambulances together with 15,000 files, files of tetanus and gangrene serum. The Italian army, which recklessly entered the territory of Great Greece, suffered great losses in a month and had to retreat to Albanian territory. This time, the Greek army, I'm sorry. <coughs> this time, the, uh, the Greek army entered Albania and repulsed the Italian army. You see here on Italian retreat, some illustrations. Greek crown prince on the way of Tirana. Meanwhile, Metaxas died on January 29, 1941. The torturer, anti-communist and hated uh, dictator of the 30s died as a national hero thanks to his resistance and success against the Italians. Upon Metaxas' death, national mourning was aired and flags were lowered at half mast in Turkey. According to some historians, Italy's failure in Greece forced Germany to intervene in the Balkans. For this reason, the Barbarossa operation was delayed, so perhaps this also had a share in the defeat in the Soviet Union lands of the German army. 
Thus, in April uh, 1941, the German-Bulgarian-Italian invasion took place in Greece. The Greek king and government uh, first withdrew to Crete, and with the occupation of Crete, the Greek government in exile established in Cairo. Because of the, uh, you see here, uh, King uh, Georgios, uh, George uh, II, uh, and uh, Prime Minister Chuderos. Because of, of the German army's progress to Egypt, under pressure from the Egyptian government, the exiled government first would go to South Africa, Pretoria, and then to London, and then would come back to Cairo in 1943. At the request of occupying forces, General Cholak Oglu formed a puppet government in Greece. The first task of the occupation administration is in many occupied countries, as in many country, uh, occupied countries by Germany, was to seize the food warehouses and send them to Germany. But Greece was never a self-sufficient country in terms of food. She was always a wheat important country. Thus, a threat of starvation arose in the big cities, but especially in Athens. The reasons for this can be summarized as follows. The country was under occupation by Italian, German, and Bulgarian forces. Most of the rural population had migrated to the cities. International, uh, uh, me, I'm sorry, internal communications and transportation were badly disorganized, destroyed railways, lack of gasoline, food and material, material had been confiscated from the beginning of the occupation. Imports from the allies had been cut off due to the United Kingdom blockade in Mediterranean. Günther Altenburg, appointed by Hitler as the administrator of the Reich in Greece. He emphasized in message to Berlin that Greece should not be allowed to fall famine. But the response he received from Hitler in July 1941 was only a vague directive to do what you can. The German Ministry for Foreign Affairs, on the other hand, insisted that it was Italy's responsibility to supply food for Greece. But Italy, Italy had no surplus of food for this purpose, had been dependent on Germany for supplies during the winter of uh, 1940-41. Besides, according to German authorities, hungry people couldn't resist. The Axis powers emphasized that famine in Greece was the result of the United Kingdom blockade in the Mediterranean and called for the lifting of the blockade of Greece in order to secure grain from non-European countries. The famine was now visible. People were collecting garbage on the streets. Please look at face and legs. Bread was dis distributing by rationing. For this reason, if one of the household members died, the official authorities were not informed and her or his body was left somewhere. It's possible, uh, part, I'm sorry, does her or his ration card continued to be used for a while. Trucks were picking up bodies from the streets in the morning. It's possible to see in an American document that number of deaths from starvation were between 600,000 daily uh, between. The Medical Society of Athens had requested permission of the Ecumenical Patriarch 
to cremate the dead due to lack of time to bury them the, uh, the orthodox, by the orthodox ritual. A very common image you see. Furniture maker's work is very good. A Greek woman goes with a German officer, but she has a loaf of bread in her hand. The fact that the news of famine began to be heard, especially in the USA, mobilized the Greek American diaspora. Fundraising for this aid has begun. Spiros Skouras, owner of the 20th Century Fox Film Company, uh, and oh, pardon. Uh, the Archbishop, uh, the, the Archbishop of Athenagoras in the USA were the leaders of this charity organization. In fact, the famine as a result of the German occupation was a good propaganda for the Allies, but pressure from the US government pushed the United Kingdom to seek a solution. The most important thing for the United Kingdom was not broken uh, that the blockade in the Mediterranean. At this point, the idea of exporting the necessary food from Turkey was put forward. The United Kingdom eventually agreed that food could be exported from Turkey to Greece because it was situated within the blockade territory, so there would be no need to lift the blockade. The suppliers of the aid would be Greek government in exile, the British and US governments in less central, uh, uh, uh, uh, sorry, US governments with the Swedish, Swiss, Swiss and Turkish governments in less central roles, non-governmental organizations such as the Red Cross uh, and Greek relief organizations in the US were much involved. The United Kingdom Commercial Corporation would buy food in Turkey, while the Greek War Relief Association in the United States would supply most of the money needed. Three companies were established in Turkey, Greece, and the United States in order to procure and transfer food to Greece. Turk S. Uh, in Istanbul, Ella Türk in Athens, and Triandafilos Fufas in New York. After the persuasion of Turkish government, the Turkish Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs stated that the vessel will be st the steamship Kurtuluş, according to information provided by the Sea Transportation General Directorate. That was quite meaningful because one translation of Kurtulish is appropriately in the circumstances salvation and also liberation. According to Lloyd's, Lloyd's register of shipping, the Kurtulish was built in the UK in 1882, the first operated in there under the name Evropides and presumably under Greek ownership. It was bought by the Tavilolu family in, uh, in 1930, when its name brand was changed to Kurtulush in 1936. If you know today Mudo company in Turkey, Mudo belongs to Tavilolu family. According to intergovernmental plan, there would be two voyages per month from Turkey. Turkey was chosen as the center for the aid because it was the only neutral state within the region and shared a border with Greece. In fact, the United Kingdom government permitted land transportation despite the blockade. But the Greek-German War of April uh, 1941 had destroyed much uh, of the railway system. Roads also had also been destroyed and were frequently impassable, while there was a shortage of trucks. 
the allies could not control such traffic in practice. The blockade was essentially a naval issue. British submarines were ordered to sink ships they encountered in the Mediterranean. So the most dangerous means of transport became the most convenient and practical way of dealing with the matter. The Kurtulish departed on its first delivery on 13 October 1941, decked out with the Red Crescent in order to be noticed by planes and submarines. On this voyage, it carried pulses, onions, egg and fish paste, medical materials and clothing, both with funds supplied by the American Greek War Relief Association. It was welcomed with great enthusiasm, as well as Turkish flags, when it arrived in Preus two days later. It was considered to be a single ray of hope for the suffering Greek nation. Newspapers in Istanbul saw the Kurtulush arrival in Preus as an opportunity to draw attention to the famine in Athens. They reported that 80% of stores in Preus were closed because they did not have any goods to sell. Dock workers took any pulses they could salvage and hid them in their pockets only to have them confiscated when checked at the harbor entrance. Besides concerns about health conditions, there was a shortage of coffins. Moreover, the amount of black bread distributed daily was less than 50 grams per person. The Union of Greeks of Constantinople started collecting money from the Greeks of Istanbul. According to reports on 22 November, the Red Crescent accepted packets from Greeks who had relatives in Greece. Packets would be opened on being handed over and would be sealed after custom inspection. Meanwhile, the Turkish press had also been focusing on the famine in Greece. It was emphasized that Greece had contributed generously to the relief effort that had followed the 1939 earthquake in Erzincan, in Eastern Turkey. Uh, some uh, 700,000 people had contributed to the raising of 2 million drachmas and that now it was Turkey's turn to help. In his we are true friends article of Ahmed Emin Yalman, who maybe you know, uh, he's from Thessaloniki, uh, from uh, uh, converted Jew uh, group, uh, converted uh, Islam, uh, Sabetaist group, you know, uh, wrote in uh, Vatan newspaper his own newspaper, says we have to prove that we are true friends. Remind, reminding his readers of the aid from Greeks and Greek Americans following the Erzincan earthquake, Yalman emphasized that Turkey should pay its moral debt to Greece in these days of disaster. He proposed two means of repaying this debt. Firstly, the Red Crescent should establish soup kitchens uh, in Greece, especially for children. Secondly, there should be commercial consignments to Greece, taking advantage of Turkey's good relations with Germany. Four days later, Nejmettin Sadak, a future minister of foreign affairs, uh, in the uh, newspaper Aksham, writing that Turkey's resources were inadequate, inadequate, that establishing kitchens wasn't like an American dream, and that the only answer was to obtain aid from the richer countries, Britain and the US, which had given abundant promises. Yalman replied two days later that if Sadak studied our export statistics, he would see that we have a surplus of food in our country. 
We export to anyone who is willing to pay. So if we export to Greece, we will both be conducting business as usual while expressing our friendship and affording a remedy for their troubles set. As a result of publicity in the press, the campaign of aid to Greece gained momentum. At the request of professional societies in Athens, employees in various, various sectors, press, municipality, museum, etc., prepared packets for their Greek colleagues. The Association of Journalists and the Association of uh, uh, uh, Doctors obtained food supplies respectively. The Turkish Press Association declared that it would donate income from their annual dinner to Greek journalists. journalists. There was an increase in packages sent by individuals. Every voyage of the vessel became an event. The press reported that an Athens street would be named Kutulus. The journalist Faruk Fenik, on returning from the Kurtulish November voyage, recounted that the vessel's crew had insisted upon leaving their own provisions in Greece and had eaten stale baked bread on the trip home. As a result of its shipments, 250,000 uh, 250, people were fed in soup kitchens and 14,000 children were provided with eggs, beans, and salted tuna in orphanages. Although it had been announced that uh, the sixth Kurtulush voyage would be 19 January 1942, the cargo of 1,800 tons consisted of food shipped by Turk Elas company as haricot beans, chickpeas, potatoes, and onions. 350 packets of grain weighing five kilos each from journalists to their Greek journalist colleagues. And 800 packets shipped, shipped by Greeks. With Ridwan captain, there was a crew of 23, accompanied by 10 Red Crescent officials on the vessel. However, in the early hours of the 20th January, the vessel struck rocks and ran aground due to poor weather and snowstorm. This is the last photograph of Kurtulus ship. It was at first believed that the Kurtulish had run aground in Hayir Sizada near to Marmara Island, but later it became known that the accident took place at Domuzburlu on Marmara Island. Uh, all the crew survived, and with a uh, ship, uh, all crew and Red Crescent officials. Uh, went to Istanbul um, the day after. Uh, the news of the sinking occasioned much anguish in Greece. The fate of Kurtulish gave rise to rumors in Greece. Some said the vessel had been torpedoed. The collaborationist Prime Minister General Cholak Oglu stated his sadness about the fate of the Kurtulush and declared his belief that Turkey would replace her with a, with a new one. The Red Crescent immediately started working on the issue. The Kurtulush had transported a total of about 10,000 tons, of which about 7,000 tons consisted of food, 140 tons of private packets, and the rest were medicine and clothing. The Dumutunar, there is a clipping here on sinking Kurtulush. 
and the Dumlupunar soon replaced the Kurtubus. Its first voyage on 21st February 1942 was welcomed by crowds in Preus, who called it uh, in Greek or Christosodefteros uh, as the second Christ. City transport, cinema, and entertainment venues were all free for the crew with only alcohol available. The daily number of rations distributed in Athens Preus during the winter of 1941-42 was 200,000, reaching 400,000 by March 1942. In May 1942, public reaction intensified in Turkey when the daily ration of bread was reduced to 150 grams per capita. Meanwhile, a member of the Red Crescent returning from Greece on the Dumlupunar announced that the situation in Greece had improved. The daily portion of bread per head for the first four days of the week was 158 grams in Athens and Preus and 254 grams for the remainder of the week. So it was became clear that the situation in Turkey in this respect was actually worse than in Greece. The Dumnupunar departed for its fifth and the uh, sixth and the last voyage on 24 of August 1942, with a cargo of beans and potatoes, after which it returned to Istanbul. The total amount shipped in all the 10 voyages, uh, 11 voyages, I'm sorry, 11 voyages, made by Kurtuluş and Dumnupnar between October 1941 and August 1942, amounted to just uh, 17,000 tons of food when the agreement had been 50,000 tons. After August 1942, there were no re regular voyages from Turkey to Greece. The Greek War Relief Association had paid Turkey a total of uh, $1,400,000. Uh, you can see here, in that period, the, the voyages, 11 voyages of Kurtuluş and Dumnupunar uh, totally, and just Halaren, uh, Swedish ship, you can see three times, and Streborg and Sigilia, uh, one time. Uh, with the difficulties in finding food in Turkey and the uh, introduction of ships to the Mediterranean from outside, Turkey would stop sending food and Greece would be better off using the ration cards started in Turkey too. After the regular voyages of the Kurtuluş and Dumlupnar, Turkish humanitarian did continue aid, aid did continue, although it gradually declined. Turkey was in particularly involved in the distribution of provisions to the Aegean islands from abroad. Tunç, Konya, Güneysu were occasionally involved in shipping aid to Greece. Turkey let Greece control Turkish foundation, property, properties in Greece, until the end of the war. Turkey gave some, some food in exchange for olives during the war years. Here, I would like to mention how the world opinion became aware of the situation of Greece. According to Alekos Zannas, head of the Greek Red Cross, there were two reasons why the famine could not be resolved. The Allies were unconvinced that Greece was in a very bad shape and Britain's blockade. Thinking that something must be done to persuade the Allies, Zannas decides to prepare a photo album to showcase the disastrous situation in the winter of 1941-42. 
although it was forbidden uh, because the Germans did didn't want this situation to be used for counter propaganda. He takes pictures reflecting the situation on the streets with his two assistants. Uh, he was hiding to flash to his hat, the machine to his coat. Three albums are prepared, one for the International Red Cross, the other for the UK embassy in Switzerland, and the third for the Greek government in exile. The secretary of the president of the International Red Cross puts the album in the drawer and forgets it. Brunel, the Athens representative of the Red Cross, International Red Cross, found the album three months later when he went to Geneva. The third album is delivered to Ferudun Demokan. The uh, also, uh, the, rep the Red Crescent representative on the Kurtulu ship, Demokan, and you can see him here from the left, the second man um, in Ankara, uh, new elected uh, the ecumenical patriarch Athena Goras uh, visits President Inunen. Uh, According to Zanas, Demokan sends it to Greek ambassador to Turkey, Rafael, who in turn sends it to the government of exile in London. The government in exile distributes it as a pamphlet in the UK and the USA. The UK bans the album for being terrible. At this point, I should also mention Ferudun Demokan's unpublished memoir on this subject. Uh, I had published this memoir in my book on Kurtulu's ship. In his memoir, which he titled the, I'm not sure if you see here openly. Yeah, uh, The Great Gamble. Demokan also touches on the photo album issue. According to Demokan, Preparing an album was his idea, and he suggested it to the Greek Red Cross authorities. But German officers, uh, officers were searching the Kurtulu ship in detail when she leaves from Preas harbor in every voyage. So the album out of Greece was really dangerous. Demokan, who received it from the relevant person in Athens, therefore, decides not to hide the album. Demogan, who came out of the Turkish embassy with an album and a top coat in his hand, puts the album on the table in the bridge of ship when he boarded and covered it up of hand with his top coat. It would not occur to German officers to look for something hidden in public. That's what Demogan meant by Great Gamble. When he landed in Istanbul, Demokan met with the mili British military attaché in Taksim, thus ensuring that the album reached the UK and the USA. Eventually, the photos reach Life magazine in the USA and are published. Conclusion. According to Mark Mazover, there were about uh, 50,000 deaths in the Athens Preus area during the 12 months after October 1941, as opposed to about um, 15,000 during the previous year. 
The famine in Greece has shown how the famine can be used as a propaganda and psychological warfare subject. Another dimension of the issue is the emergence of famine as a preferred policy in order to prevent resistance. The invaders hope that the hungry people would not be able to resist, that the possibility of resistance would thus disappear, and they supported the shortage of food to a certain extent. Turkey, due to the threat from the Germans in World War II, it remained neutral but sided with the Allies. Because the Germans had come to the borders of Turkey by dominating both Bulgaria and Greece. For this reason, Turkey has fulfilled the wishes of the Allies regarding Greece, albeit at the expense of forcing the conditions from time to time. In addition, as Greece was occupied by Bulgaria, as per the Balkan Entente of 1934, she had, Turkey had to assist Greece militarily. It was not possible for her to do this, but she also had a debt of conscience. All these were effective in aiding Greece. This aid issue has come to the fore from time to time in the Turkish public opinion, but it is uh, hidden that it's a trade in a sense, that Turkey sells food to Greece in exchange for money. And the issue has only been discussed with the formulation of Turkey's outstretched helping hand. However, this does not eliminate the fact that Turkey did this during a troubled period in the war environment and also sent real aid through campaigns. At this point, the Red Crescent showed a great example of solidarity in serious cooperation with the International Red Cross. Also, in these years, Turkey afforded shelter about 25,000 Greeks fleeing from the occupation, occupation. Most of these refugees made their way to Egypt in order to enlist in the Greek armed forces in the Middle East. In this period, I think that Turkey gave a good test in terms of friendship between two countries with her aid policy. Lastly, uh, if you ask me what happened to Kurtulish Vrek, I should say that uh, scrap dealers uh, dived into the Vrek, uh, smashed and sold it. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, Alchin, thank you very much for a very enlightening talk and some very sobering images as well. Just shows how brutal that war was and how much the Greek civilians su suffered um, and how callous the Germans were as well. Um, so if anybody wants to ask questions, um, you can either jump in or send a chat message and I can read them out. But since we're so few in number, um, do feel free to jump in. Um, so to keep, start the ball rolling, shall we say, I'd like to ask one or two questions. Um, now, the, there are a lot of technical challenges in sending a civilian ship across the sea in wartime conditions. Um, so that could be submarines operated by both the uh, by both sides because effectively it's a neutral ship, but maybe at night, you know, the ship can't be recognized. So there's that. And you have three nations, Italians, the Germans and the British operating submarines there. So presumably the Red Cross has to try to inform all three powers that this ship is going to be going along this route that but of course you know it can't provide exact coordinates so there's there was always a risk that the ship would be either sunk by submarines or hit a mine and again the mines could have been laid by either side 
as the British were retreating from Greece, they could have left mines behind and the Germans might have used mines to stop the British blockade in turn. Um, so was the Red Cross instrumental in getting all this coordination to all three powers before the first ship set sail? Um, you are right. Um, at the beginning, from uh, all countries, um, uh, by getting permission uh, and learning the root coordinations, the co coordinates uh, on the GNC, uh, and then uh, started the navigation of the ship. Uh, the um, uh, operation was like this during the day. Uh, was uh, the ship was navigating, and by nights were um, staying in the uh, island harbors in Aegean uh, Sea, and. There was exact coordinates and German submarines were waiting the ship uh, uh, near to Preus Harbor and then they were uh, uh, uh, entering together to the Preus Harbor. Uh, the coordination of the operation um, belongs to uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not the Red Cross. Red Cross just um, operating the, the navigation uh, and collecting uh, the food uh, and the, the packages. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, the the Ministry chose the Red Cross, the uh, Red Crescent because it was a, a civilian um, establishment, institution. That's why, I mean. Uh, so, but the, the, the issue is, was uh, political and the coordinator was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Tur of Turkey. Okay, right. Um, the next question is, um, do you get a sense on the German side there might have been two opposing views the hardline germans sort of saying well just let them all starve because then the population is easy to control they will not rise up because they're too weak and then the opposing maybe more humanitarian side shall we say saying no um these people are under our protection and as an occupying power we have a moral duty to ensure they survive and also it's good to have good relations with the um, Red Cross as they also look after our prisoners of war held in allied camps. So do you have any sense how the Germans kind of agreed to this? Because presumably they would have not agreed to anything similar for, say, Russia, where they presumably considered those people to be less valuable to put a very crude expression. Uh, I think for Germans, there was a dilemma. Uh, there was already a resistance in Greece against German uh, administration or occupation. And, and also there was a famine. But another thing is, you know, uh, the allies were using as a subject of counter propaganda. You see, German uh, invaders, uh, when you go to a, a country in, in Europe, this country is going down. There is a famine, uh, they have uh, nothing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is a very, very good, um, uh, propaganda subject. So uh, that's why German administrator of Greece uh, gave a permission to 
uh, allies to organize this operation because the famine level was very high seriously in the winter of um, 1941-42. Um, okay, yet another question. Now, there were 11 shipments by Turkey. Did they stop after that date because the famine conditions eased and food started coming from other nations or the Greek agriculture was beginning to recover? Um, I mean, was it a case of um, Turkey no longer needed to do that because after all, it was short of food itself as well, presumably? Yeah, uh, uh, just after the, no, in the uh, uh, uh, summer of 1942, uh, uh, British blockade is finished. And then from, uh, especially from Argentina and Canada, uh, the ships started to bring uh, wheat to Greece, uh, officially. I mean. <clears throat> and uh, in the same time, uh, economy and um, uh, uh, rural production uh, were going down in Turkey. That's why, like Greece, started here to use a, a, a ration card for bread. Uh, so uh, the government uh, uh, forbid uh, to export food from Turkey. Right. The final question is, so the Zamas photo albums, which were smuggled at great risk to himself, obviously, were they instrumental in lifting the British blockade of Greece and allowing for sh um, allied and neutral ships to bring food into Greece after that date? So was it the photographs that basically changed the policy? Yes, I believe it. Yes, okay. exactly. Right. Um, so do we have any questions from the floor, please? Well, if not, I'll um, fire another question here. Um, now, you talked about Bulgaria, um, Bulgaria having expansionist policy even before the Second World War. And I think they occupied Kavala and that strip, so they had an outlet to the Aegean. Um, were the conditions in Bulgaria occupied Greece as bad in terms of starvation and stuff? I mean, was there suffering there as well, in the same sort of scale? You know, yes, that? it was the same because the the, um, the fertile lands of Greece, in fact, in Macedonia, in north part of Greece. So uh, this part of Greece was under the Bulgarian occupation. The same thing again. Uh, realized there but the what is the different the difference is this if you live in rural area with different ways you can find something to eat but in big cities this is not possible this is a different but the bulgarian occupation um was always a, a nightmare for Greeks and and Greek nationalism uh, because the Macedonia you know at, at the uh, uh, at the last quarter of uh, uh, Ottoman Empire uh, it was a big uh, problem between Greek Bulgarian uh, Serbian uh, nationalisms 
and also the last one, Lilach nationalism, rise. Uh, so uh, the Macedonia was very important for this this greater uh, maps. They are greater maps. That's why um, the main enemy until Cyprus issue in Greece uh, was Bulgaria. And maybe you know, it's an example, uh, uh, among Muslim community in Western Trace, there is a group, um, we call them uh, Tomak, Tomaks. Uh, they are Muslim, but speaking Bulgarian. And according to Bulgarian nationalism, they are Bulgarian, with the pressure of uh, Ottoman, Empire, Ottoman administration, they converted to Islam. So two times in 20th century, in Balkan Wars, and then this period that we talk on, uh, Bulgarians, Bulgarian church, I mean, clergy, uh, by pressure, uh, baptized again these Pomaks, some of them in Bulgarian uh, in Bulgarian church. So this is a very typical, I mean, revenge of history for Bulgarians, I think. Well, yeah, it's a, to be a minority in the Balkans is, is, is not a fun thing. And if you look at Kosovo today, perhaps uh, a similar story is going on there where yeah. Um, the Serbian minority in Kosovo feels they're being um, squashed by Albanian nationalism. So um, there, there are no easy solutions here, of course. Um, okay, so last call. Um, any questions or comments from the audience, please? Well, in that case, Thank you very much, Alchin, for a very enlightening I thank you. presentation. And I certainly have learned a lot and I've taken quite a few notes. And I may also send some additional questions by email as well. Of course. Thank you again. Okay, and wish you a... Thank you to all. Good evening, good year, and continued success in all your future projects. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night.